Right now, in this session, I think I'm going to start first by running through all the colours on my palette that I will be using or not using. I will start with Payne's Grey, which we've spoken about, Cobalt Violet, Ultramarine Blue, Manganese Blue, Viridian Green, Sap Green, which not everybody likes to use, but I find it quite a useful colour. Sap Green, Yellow Ochre, Cadmium Orange, and cadmium, an orange is always useful. You think that if you can mix red and yellow you will get a good orange, but you don't always get a good orange. It's better to use one that has been made, manufactured if you like. Cadmium Orange, Permanent Rose, Mars Violet, which is a kind of very deep brick red, very useful. A type of burnt sienna which isn't burnt sienna, I'm just trying to remember what it's called. Um, it's called light red, which again is a kind of a brick red colour. And finally, burnt umber. That's my range of colours. I usually lay them all out regardless of what I'm going to do. I put the same colours on my palette. Now, to resume the picture, I think I will introduce some of these foreground rocks which are dark because that will throw the background into the background so to speak. In other words the lightness and haziness of all this should become apparent when the darkness of this is put in. I don't want to make it too dark but it's definitely a dark statement. I'm going to mix a colour which will contain Payne's Grey, again, Mars Violet, one of my favourite colours, as you probably gathered, a little blue, ultramarine, perhaps a little burnt umber, now, let's see what happens. The rocks in this particular part of Cornwall are a mixture of violet rocks, violet and green, especially in the Polzeth area. So to use violet and green is not a bad idea. I've got some figures here. I'm not going to keep to the exact shape of the rock on my study. I'm going to adapt it to suit what's going on on the picture, on this picture. So if I just put in, I'll wet the brush a bit because it's a little dry on this canvas. That's better. Now this colour, this tone, cannot remain flat like this. It's got to have, it's got to have things in it, which are based on what's going on on the sketch. But not completely. I'm going to invent a few things as I go along. Paint round the figures. Do I always paint the figures last in a picture? Yes, I do. I draw them in, in the case of these two, I draw them in very carefully and then I forget about them and I concentrate on the background first. And when the background looks as if it's nearing completion, then I can go to town on the figures. These, this rock will have fingers of rock going out into the sea. Here. 
here in this area here is a pool of water and somewhere there is a pile of sand somewhere there it doesn't have to be exactly the same and the beauty of oil paint is that you can change it whenever you want if it doesn't look right the paint from the last session is completely dry Because it's dry doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot be rubbed out because it is only touch dry, it's not solid dry all the way through. So there's the beginning and I've got another rock here which this person is going to stand on, sit on rather. Don't know whether it's a man or a woman doesn't much matter but these figures will be slightly indistinct something like that just lay the dark in it's almost a completely neutral color While I'm thinking of these rocks, I'm also thinking of the sand because the rocks are actually sort of lying on the sand with water around them. Another one here. Now. You can really, I don't know whether it's the correct word is invent, create, but you can do what you want, that's another way of putting it, as long as it looks right and conveys the feeling that you want. That also makes sense. in the context of the place and the picture. The rocks don't need to be finalised now because in a little while I'm going to... I'm going to go down into the sand think might just have to put in a hint of figures here did I say that too quietly I said I'm just putting this in here, this figure, because it occupies a place right in front of the light sea. There's another one here. Little devil.
These figures give scale to the picture, but they will do once I've done them. And there's also a certain amount of light on their left hand side that shows well against the dark rock. This one's on the other side, it's going to get wet. I think I'll take a little brush for this. Little pointy synthetic hair brush. The next thing I shall go to is the sand where the sea meets the rock and the rock meets the sand and the sea meets the sand as well oh, I can't remember. okay now, let's think about the wave here is breaking on very wet sand and on this side it's breaking against these little fingers of rock and on the sand. I'm not sure what that is. What is that? I don't know. So this is where we make the connection between the sea and the land, if you like. Let's go straight in. Big brush for the moment. And a dark sand colour because the sand is very wet. dark sandy colour. Now it's not going to be all sandy colour because some of it will reflect the blue of the sky. That's a bit too dark. That's a bit too near. I'm using some of my burnt timber. Later, or pretty soon, I've got to find out how that wave lands on this sand and looks convincing. Some darks. leave spaces in this for where the rivulets reflect the light of the sky. Um, where am I? Here. So for this sand colour, because the sand is a very difficult colour to pin down, 
if you try to describe it in words all you come out with is oh it's sandy colour but the actual colours involved are white obviously yellow ochre but not as much as you think a little bit of orange and some burnt umber because sand is a mixture of warm colours and cool colours and of course where it's wet it's dark so it's a bit of an enigmatic substance of the artist's sand but very important obviously One reason for using a large brush when you think you don't really want a large brush is that a larger brush will give you accidental effects that a smaller one won't. In other words, a small one you get very niggling with a small brush, but with a large one it's so clumsy that you just have to accept the little accidents that it gives you. Happy accidents sometimes. Now, that's as much of the sound I'm doing for the minute because I want to get back onto the sea and the wave. For that I need a bit more white. I buy this stuff in groups of three large tubes. They don't last all that long. This uh, alkyd white. Now, different brush. This, brush. this is the synthetic one. Soft. Can be quite precise because I'm going. I'm going to this wave here. dark, darkish, neutral colour, tending towards blue. Little mauve. Mauve is a very useful colour. Violet, mauve, purple, call it what you want. I'm just going to move my terps pot over here so it's near my right hand. Now, in this portion here, I want some more white, white water going back and up into this. So I'm going to do that now. I started it yesterday, but I didn't, didn't finish it. Didn't, didn't finalise it. going up in the concave wave. Convex and concave. Then at the base of that con concave wave, I was going to say concrete wave, but at the base of that concave wave, I must make a little dark because it is always darker at the bottom, just a touch. This is where things get fiddly. Ah, <sighs> sometimes with a concave way, you get bright sparkles within it which I might put in, but not yet. It 
really ought to go this end because this is near the near the light. I'm going to do little dark bits, teeny, teeny little dark marks. They're marks. Okay, that's enough for a minute. Now, thinking forwards now as the wave comes in. It's not going to finish just like that. It's going to have wet water underneath. When I say wet water, you know what I mean. when you start seeing lots of things to do but you can't do them all at the same time the more the painting develops the more you can see what needs doing so that wave needs more darks in it now I think I'm going to Try something here. Define these waves a little bit better, or this wave rather, the incoming breaking wave. Of course sometimes when the sea's a bit rougher you get a lot of movement in waves and a lot of waves. Working leftwards on the rocks or along the rocks. I'm just putting my little pool of water in. which is rather a silly thing to call it, but I know what I mean. I mean wet ground caused by water, not caused by damp. Standing water, even. All these technical terms. <coughs> now then, let's work a bit more on these rocks. They are important. If you're going to put rocks in, they've got to be convincingly done.
the rocks and the headlands are actually the only permanent things that you're painting. Everything else is moving and goes away. The clouds, the sea, the tide, the waves, even the sand is not permanent. Hmm. I want that to join up with that. It's got to join up to make sense. We've got to make sense of it all. So while I'm doing this, I'm looking at other bits of the picture which I know are going to need attention but I've got to try and concentrate on one thing at a time that's got to be like that now I've got to try and work out what these rocks are doing to give them a sense of of modelling in the right direction they are coming down like this this one is, I don't know what it's doing, there we are. Therefore, therefore that will come here. Yes. Good. Now. I want to have more light here. Because this little figure is clear cut, stands out against the light, silhouetted. If figures don't work, you can always rub them out. That's being a bit negative, but I would like these two to work. But I'm concentrating on this light sea at the moment. I'll put them back after. What you need to be careful of in the sea, and probably in all painting, but in sea painting, is you you must try and not get a, a dead colour. A colour that doesn't look anything at all. That's difficult to describe in but I know what I mean. Always be careful to try and get the head on little figures the right size. It's easy to get them too big. Big head. I mustn't fiddle too much on this. Don't know what he's doing, that's the trouble. He looks uncomfortable. Go away. Right, 
around. He didn't like that from the man. Neither one thing nor the other. Let's see what happens. Uh, right. Now, going on on this theme of where the, where the wave, the foreground wave, meet, meets the sand and the rocks, I'm going to move rightwards from here. I'm going to have some rough paint here, suggesting where the waves splash against the rocks here. I was going to have, which you often get here, is spray blowing up. But spray blowing up very often is darker than what it's seen against. And I don't really want to darken anything here at all. So I'm using my light waves for all of this here. I'll try to form these rocks a little bit better. Remember the lights coming from the left. So are these rocks, have these rocks got the light on them or not? It's difficult to decide and I can't tell from this study, funnily enough. I would say the left hand side has got light. The right hand side has not got light. Seems logical. So there's sort of half in the light, half in the shadow. I hope that as I put these darks in, that the background will sink away into the distance with atmosphere somewhere around there, which I should probably increase later. Well, we're getting somewhere, I hope. Rocks, of course, very often have permanent wet on them, and that wet shines very light. Because, of course, all of the sand in this on this beach gets covered by the sea. Within an hour of this, the sea will be up to about that height, covering that rock completely. So the rocks never really have a chance to get very dry. All right. Mm. I want it more mauve. That's better. Ah, yes. The reflection in this part of the water, because this is going to be water here, as in that, is going to be dark because it's reflecting the rock, that person there, whoever he or she is, has a slight reflection. No. Decision, decision. Let's work this little figure out.
get too fiddly with this. But at the same time, it's got if I'm putting it in, it's got to be done. Now then, now then, now then. We have a little pile of sand there which I want to put in. I will do my best. And here it comes. was supposed to be higher as you can may be able to see from the drawing here but I won't make it quite so high don't want to overdo it Would it help to have C sound effects when you're painting these things? It might do. I've never tried. One of the secrets of painting or drawing is not to look at your picture for too long and start worrying about it. Leave that till afterwards, till it's either finished or you've, had a, or you've got a break or something. While you're painting, just do it without looking too much. The more you look, the more you worry about what you've done. Which is not always helpful. It's all about self-judgment. What's the other word? Assessment. Self-assessment. It's really a tricky problem. When you're in a life drawing room and you're only given five minutes to draw the figure, you often draw a much better figure than when you're given half an hour. Why is that? <laughs> Why is that? That is because you don't have time in five minutes to worry. You just do. Do it. I'm just going to start altering the angle of this strip of rock here. I don't know if it's a strip of rock or whether it's a, a split of sand. It's a good word, isn't it? Split of sand. Oh. 
But whatever it is, it needs to go up like that. And the other needs to come down. It's strange in a way because in a picture like this you're painting shapes that you've got a slight idea what they represent but not completely. But it doesn't matter, we hope. Now then, I need a different brush. I'll use this one. No, I can't use that one. I'll use this one. Aha. Because I need more light. Scumbling over the top It's a nice word, scumble It means laying opaque colour over dry over dry colour dry paint with a sort of a dry brush. In fact, in watercolour it would be called dry brush. Things are getting lighter now, that's good. Put a little bit of haze in here. Loosen it up a bit. Now I have to admit I've just put out another colour on my palette and that is cadmium red. I wonder if you can spot where I've just put it on the picture. It's near here. It's on one of these little figures. On what looks like a pair of swimming trunks. But I may change it. Okay, I'm just slipping this little figure in. See if I can do it fairly quickly. It's where my cadmium red comes in useful. So the cadmium colours I use are all hues. No, they're not, because it's cadmium orange is not a hue. It's pure cadmium orange. But you can use a hue. They're very popular at the moment. Because they don't use valuable resources. They are artificial, if you like. And very permanent. Non-poisonous. Which can't be said for all colours. But don't try eating them anyway. And don't put your brush in your mouth. Now. Gradually creeping up on this.
without knowing where that one is. And then I think I can get going down the down the sand. Get some of the sand in. Standing water. Someone's probably built a little dam for their castle. Now I've still got to worry slightly about what happens as these waves come in. Slightly ill-defined at the moment. using a pretty small brush here, pointy one. There are lots of things you can try out with beach pictures in your imagination. The effects on a beach, of course, like anywhere else, I suppose are very transient. and don't really follow any rules. So you can do what you want, up to a point. I hope I'm getting the feeling of smaller ripples rippling in. I hope. But at the moment I'm darting from one thing to another. Doesn't matter. I'm also seeing that I haven't put much in the way of internal shaded bits into these waves. Which if the light's coming from the left, you've got to put in. Because there will be shadows within the waves. It's important. Now. In a sense, this is real improvisation, really. I'm doing whatever comes into my head. Is that what improvisation is? Yes, it is. Making it up. Nothing wrong with that. And if you do something you don't like, you can always change it. Change it back to what it was, or just change it. Now, I think we need to get down to the sand. I'm going to look at this back, backwards in a mirror now. Yes, I'm sure we all do this. We look at our picture backward in a mirror. This is a little hand mirror here. A bit dirty, but I can see, I can see in it. Um, we look at our picture backwards in the mirror because that gives us an idea, it gives us a fresh idea of what the picture looks like. Because when you've been painting it for some time you get used to it, your brain can't take it all in, so you need another view of it. 
Some people turn the picture upside down. Some people look at it backwards in a mirror. I recommend looking at it backwards in a mirror, and I don't like that, what I've just done there. So I'm get rid of that. That's what I want to do. I'm painting wet paint on top of dry paint that was originally applied quite thickly. So the brush strokes, the brush marks, brush strokes, actually show through, which is useful, or can be useful, with luck. Now I have another. This is not something you want to do too often, because otherwise your brain gets used to it and it doesn't work anymore. But you can see anomalies that you wouldn't otherwise see. Okay, let's not fuss anymore there. Sand. In sand, or with sand, the most important thing, from my point of view, is footprints. Because footprints can be used... I mean, in my original sketch here, there are footprints, but not many and not very well defined. Um, I would put more in this picture, because I want to lead towards these two figures here, with a, with a feeling of perspective there, and maybe a bit like that. So I'm now beginning to think about the two figures of the girls, which up till now I have completely ignored, quite rightly. But as the picture develops I have to start thinking about it. These rivulets here will hopefully also lead towards the girls. In fact, footprints are quite difficult to paint. You need to be rather bold when you do it. So let's just indicate some boldly. Go forth boldly. Just to make sure that we don't forget to put them in. They will also give a feeling of distance because the ones in the foreground are going to be big, as big as a person's foot would be if they were in the foreground. These girls are in the middle ground, which is unusual for me. I usually put my figures in the foreground. I'm just dotting these in, dotting these in rather rather quickly because I need to know that I've thought about them. There was a lot of such things as seaweed and rocks as well. Foreground rocks.
people also make comments about your picture. Why did you do that? Why did you do this? Um, that can sometimes be useful. Things that you hadn't thought of. And you can always change things. I mean, there's certain things I wouldn't like to change. So if you said, why have you put these two girls there? Why haven't you put them there? I would be annoyed. I wouldn't want to change that. That's a major change. I'd rather repaint the picture. Ooh, this is nice. Bit of water swirling around. My ultramarine again. Ultramarine and white, not mixing with anything because it's on bare canvas. Whereas here, it's not on bare canvas. So that will change the colour to a sandier colour, which may not matter. Now, I'm thinking this. Moment. Can't remember how, what I was going to do now. I want these two girls to be reflected in standing water. Therefore, I've got to have some some of the wet stuff down here. If it mixes with the sand. It doesn't matter. You can see why you need so much white. Always buy white in big tubes. And as you progress with your painting, you can see the things that you started off with, where you started, and maybe you start seeing faults in what you have done when you thought it was okay when you did it. It's best to leave that till the end if you're going to make alterations and not get involved in too much soul searching. So I can see that as something I would want to change and that. And I'm going to do it now. And I just told you not to do it. Can't leave it. Typically I start a painting very quickly, or that's to say it advances very quickly but then it starts taking longer and ends up taking really quite a long time. I 
I've got to leave that because I liked that bit when I did it. But. Okay. That's that. This is peculiar. Okay, almost. I've put a bit of cadmium red into my sand now. Always be careful not to make your sand too red, because red is one colour that doesn't normally predominate in sand. Except, of course, in Devon, where the sand is a reddish colour. Let's do a hint of a hint of reflection. A bit of sap green and a bit of Payne's grey. Just a hint. I'll do it properly when I do the figures. That's the other leg somewhere here. just to establish that this is actually the wet stuff. I'm going to put some footprints back in in a minute. I'm covering them over a bit now. So this painting really is about reality from one of your studies or more than one of your studies and also your past experience because I've done many many sketches of this, drawings of it in the past. So it's a combination of that and invention. This subject is a good excuse for letting yourself go and inventing things. Is it, is it an invented picture? I think it is, really. Letting the brush, or I'm hoping that the brush will, letting the brush form little shapes 
in the thick paint, letting the brush do the work and the paint do the work. Oil paint is best applied thickly. You can't always apply it thickly, but it's at its best when it's thick. Colour that I can think of it might be useful. Now. in the beginning I said that these two figures, the girls, have got a sort of a feeling of going leftwards, leaning leftwards, going leftwards, maybe their hair blowing leftwards and I want to develop that when I come to them. So I want everything else in the picture reflect that. I did say these clouds should do that, but I don't seem to have done that very well. Maybe I could do it afterwards. Now, before I go any further, just a little hint. movement I want. Though I'm not doing the figures for the minute, but I'm just sort of preparing the ground. Point and darting, darting around the picture. 
probably a bit too much now. Still, that's the way it goes. I'm trying to see everything in one go. How long does concentration last for? That's the question. Not all that long. I reckon about an hour. So I know that tomorrow this painting will be dry and I can work on top of dry paint, which to me is a great advantage. Not everybody likes that. Some people like their painting to be wet for ages so they can work wet in wet. It all depends on temperament. That's too dark. got a lighthouse to put, it's not a lighthouse, it's a day marker here, day mark, there. I've got another little one to put here and I've got a spade to put here. No buckets then. This, I think, is Travaux's lighthouse. Mm. Making a bit of a meal of this. Here. 
perched on the edge. Yeah. Hmm. Now I'm introducing some lights into these footprints because they're not all footprints. Some of them are just bits of stuff. Especially in the foreground. As you go further back, all these irregular shapes don't really exist. So the light catches a footprint round about there. And here. Oh, it catches it on the other side, there. Now I'm going to start wiping away the paint that has covered the two figures. And you could do it later, but I'll do it now. Because when it dries, it becomes a lot more difficult to remove. Not impossible, eh? but it's easier when it's wet. So right back to where the drawing is. Uh, 
That's okay. Oh, there's a big blue light now. Go away. 